Hi, welcome to the 14th program in the Art and Neurology series. In this program, we meet again with Jess Statler. For those of you who have been watching the series, you may recall Jess from the compilation of interviews that I did with artists over at the Arlington Center for the Arts Open Studios back in the fall of 2015. While Jess has continued to do more of the same kind of art, a lot of it is based on using recycled materials, and we meet with Jess at her home studio, and she tells us a bit about how she got into doing this kind of art, and then she shows us how she actually creates a one of her pieces. And believe it or not, a couple of her tools are a garlic press and a pasta roller. And so I think you're going to enjoy listening to Jess, learning more about her and her art. And as always, I thank you for watching. So Jess, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, Lynn. And it's um, the first time I met you, or, or you showed me your art over at the Open Studios back in 2015. You talked to me about some of the upcycling that you were doing. And interestingly, since then, I've met another artist that does upcycling. She actually did a more more of a display um, piece using thousands of batteries. And so, so it's interesting to see, you know, that you're not the only person that does upcycling in this area. Or excuse me, see, does up like upcycling for artistic reasons in this area? Yeah, that's interesting. I would really like to see the batteries at some point. So I'll 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 look for that uh, later. Um, yeah, I use Altoids for my baseline um, raw material for my art. Although honestly, almost any size um, tin, this is a good size. One of the things that I need to be very careful about is how much it flexes. See, this doesn't flex too much, but oh, this one is full of beads, so I have to open it carefully. Um, this is, you see how it flexes back and forth a little bit? Um, when I'm done, it is very easy for that kind of flexing to, to kind of flex the clay right off of the surface of, of my work. So, so I'm very careful about not picking um, tins that are too large. I got you. So, so yeah, I like using this size material for, um, for creating my finished product. Here's one from uh, a Valentine's theme from uh, chocolates. I, I think there was just like... Um, might have been a, um, I want to say Hershey's or something like that, something simple. And they sell these, you know, seasonally. So I'm always looking around this time of year because it's uh, February right now to find heart-shaped boxes. Right. But for the most part, um, here's a finished piece that uses a, a pseudo shell, an abalone design. So that's one version and I also I've been lately working on various kinds of pride flags to um, just you know make beautiful art that right. uses things that would otherwise be thrown away right right and interestingly we probably by the time this video is edited and put together the pride flag box will be a little more relevant to, to the, yeah. time, the, the Valentine's box but then there's always Valentine's next year and yeah, it's true. Although any any heart shaped box, I mean, you it doesn't it's it's relatively season. Um, you know, this is more of a more of a November theme if you're yeah. going with Day of the Dead. Yeah. So you know. And with that kind of black and white theme, even for Father's Day, which is probably going to be coming. Sure, up soon, sure. Unless, unless it's just past. Yeah, but but um, we're certainly going to talk more about you know, the art that you do. Yeah, but I just want to know a little bit more about how you got involved with doing this kind of art and maybe your history. As an artist? Okay. Uh, well, uh, my mother is an artist and uh, had an art studio always, and an art. she had an art shop uh, when I was growing up, so I've always been around art and always been encouraged to be creative. So uh, it was, um, I started doing just little fiddly things when I was uh, in grade school with clay and then moved from that to um, to making beads and this pretty standard what you think about when you think about polymer clay which you know has this is um, I'm not sure how many of your viewers have seen polymer clay in in the wild before but this is basically my palette and it mixes like um, 
like paint. And so basically, if you wanted to make orange, simply take these two and eventually you get orange. Right. So, um, so that's, so I learned how to first work in paint and then moved on to clay. And I like the sculpting quality of, of clay. I like being able to, to make little, little objects as well as do smooth surfaces. Um, so I started doing this particular kind of work when uh, I, a friend of mine showed me, oh, hey, did you know that you could basically take what I was doing already, which was doing more like uh, figurines and, and things that uh, have like wings and dragons and fairies. And it's like, but you could do things with, with, with Altoid boxes. And I was like, wow, I never thought of that. So we hung out one day and we did that for a while and I basically, that was it. I really, really love making things that are basically mostly practical. Right. So, so then the upcycling is kind of an uh, um, offshoot. I mean, it wasn't like the intent of the art, right? No, but it's, it's a nice benefit. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, yeah. So, so because in the case of the art, of the artists, I mean, that was kind of the point was mm -hmm. to take the batteries and and make them into I mean, it make them into an artistic piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was the batteries in particular that she wanted to use. It would have been you know the same if she had used something else that wasn't recyclable. I mean, so right. so in a sense, it's, it you know I'm not putting a value statement on 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 this. I mean, but kind of I like it when the benefit of something manifests itself even if that wasn't the original intent. So yeah. that's kinda cool. And and so so um so you've been working in clay for a long time. And have you worked in any other media? Yes. Uh actually um for example, um just here off camera is um a hat that I'm working on. Uh -huh. I do a lot of of fiber art. I also spin this is not my own hand spun, but um, but yeah, the pink hats right now are very, very popular. So I've been making a lot of pink hats. Cool. So yeah, I also do watercolors and um, those, uh, that's mostly what I do is, is clay, knitting, spinning and uh, watercolor. I got it. Uh, so, so, um, hmm. so you, it, the purpose for your art it, is it just self-expression or or it, is it a income generating or a combination well that making money is nice but i i never expect to make money um breaking even is about as good as it gets so as long as i can keep buying supplies that's that's uh that's a win for me i got it and so so um, so i met you over at the aca open studios mm -hmm. And since then, it's now clear that they are having to relocate. And, uh, any impact on you? Not? Uh, well, it's always um, that's always a hard thing to have to lose a space after being there for the better part of 30 years. So um, I'm hoping that their new space will be good and they'll be able to, to continue to do all of the programs that they want to do but it's it's going to be um i think a challenge all change is hard right right but uh, i guess i'm asking because you don't have a studio there this is, no, this is where you work yep. and, and so it's more a sense of community right that you get right. from from the aca so i was wondering to what extent it was the location that matters as much as it was the fact that the organization exists right? Oh, I'm I'm very much in favor of having the organization there because I love I love that they do children's theater and right. offer classes to everybody, and having studio space was nice. Although I never did uh, look into that for myself. I got you. So I'm hoping their new space will be almost as good, if not better. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I think with the right attitude, I mean, even if it's a little difficult in time, I mean, people will get used to it and and, yeah. and figure out ways to you know make it at least as good. Being as the previous space, and then who knows what other opportunities will manifest in themselves. You know, so true. Yeah. And so, so is there um, anything that you want to show me about uh, what you're doing these sure. days? Sure. Um, well, why don't I um, give you a demonstration on how to make a surface like this? That this is um, a combination of several features. Um, I wanted to show uh, you some of the ways in which I use. 
unusual tools that you wouldn't expect to use. Um, like for example, my, my two key features, uh, two, two key tools that I use are a pasta roller mm -hmm. and a garlic press. With these two tools, I can do a fair amount of things, but it's really the, um, the pasta roller that, that makes me really step up my game and it allows me to make very, very thin sheets of, of clay very, very usable. So, for example, if I were to make something like this, I would... Uh, I'm just trying to decide what two colors to use. Any suggestions? Uh, so, let's see. Uh, so, it's going to be... It could be any two colors right, as long but what as is they're it gonna, high is, contrast. Is it going to be on this black and white? Um, I'm going to put oh, it on, on, the, on, the on this. I got it. So, high contrasting two colors. You know, um, how about the, the lavender and pink? Lavender and pink. Okay. Feel free to overrule. Over, actually, I guess I said lavender. I was thinking more of that purple. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That. And how about... Um, yeah, actually, I can I can also show how nice it is that the, this particular machine helps me um, blend colors really, really nicely. Yeah. So, um, so I'm just going to do a quick run. So basically... You can't really do that with just a roller, right? At all, it just does not work. It uh, it provides such a, a con smooth consistency. So you figured this out on your own using the the pasta. No, maker? this is this is a um, a tool that a lot of polymer clay artists okay. use. All right. So I think I'm going to use these two colors together. Okay. Yeah. Dark purple and uh, magenta. That's fine. So. We just won't collaborate on any other pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so I use there's there's two kinds of, of 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 clay that are most popular around here to be used. Um, I use one called Sculpey, also known as Primo. Primo is the is the specific brand or or subset. Other people use Fimo which is, um, I believe it's a German clay, oh. and it allows for much higher detail because it's a, it's, it's a little bit, it cooks at a different level. So. so here we have two different colors, which are easily differentiated. Um, so what I'm going to do is make them line up a little bit. And then I have a whole bunch of texture plates. So I don't have to necessarily do those particular swirls, um, but it's right here, so I will. So what I'm going to do is... Oh, I see. Oh, cool. Nice. And so then, if you shave off the top layer, hopefully this will work. There we go. That the imprint will be left behind course doing it on camera is always fun might have to do this one more time but you can sort to start to see along the edge it's a matter of getting a very very thin cut but not too you can't go too deep otherwise it doesn't work you'll just shape everything off right Yep, I'm going to have to try that one more time. Okay. But one of the nice things about this particular activity is that even when you mess something up, you can take 
what you had started uh -huh. and just use that for a different design. Right. Because um, obviously you can't unmix these. Right. So this will be a very nice color. Right. All right. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So. Kind of recycling the constituent <laughs> elements. Yeah. yeah. In fact, um, this, for example, is just a mix. I had mixed all of these from, from previous. Like it had, it used to look like this. Right. And then eventually if you keep mixing it and mixing it, it will turn into a solid color again. Right. So. So even so, that that's a really gorgeous color too. Yeah. It is. Almost like getting into deep dusk like colors. Yeah. So I'm just going to do this. Yeah, we'll just use that color. And... Uh, how about some uh, silver? Sure. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Actually, it gives me an idea yeah, uh, of a box with like a, a sunrise on it, you know, with the sunbeams coming out. Yeah. That would be pretty. Yeah. Uh, I went on vacation in December and and was very inspired to do uh, sort of a, a water at dusk and having, uh, you know, how when when just after the, the sun goes down and the sky is that gorgeous color of blue right. and all of the trees and, and shrubberies are, are sort of a, are, are deep black. And right. so you have that, that high contrast. Right, yeah. So I want to try to, to replicate that at some point right. in the near future and let, but use sunset colors yeah. as well. So, all right, let's try this again. This time I'm using a very thin layer on top and a thicker layer on the bottom and maybe that will will work a little bit more in my favor and press a little bit harder. I always work on a piece of plexiglass so that it doesn't stick to right. to my surface. Right. Yep, that's much better. Ah, there. Second time is a charm. Great. So where do you get all your Altoids boxes? People frequently give them to me. Uh -huh. I will, um, there was, there's only been a few times when I was desperate for a specific size and had to go buy them. Right. Or, you know, I, I tend to be somewhat um, ridiculous and will buy cookies uh, that come in tins on, just so right. I can have the tin later. Right, right. Well, if you do that and you need someone to eat the cookies. Right. You just, um, you know, I, I live close by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also I, I really like using tea tins as well yeah. and uh Harney and Sons is is well known for, for making a very nice tin right. as well as a decent tea. Right. So there's about eight settings on a pasta roller and you have to be careful not to go too thin, otherwise it turns into tissue paper and and sticks to the rollers. I got you. Okay. And so I usually don't go much above about level five. Right. So. Cool. I see. Oh, okay. I get it now. Cool. So that's that is one of many many tricks. I also use a whole lot of of various molds. So, for example, I've got. Um, an octopus. Oh, that's very cool. And that is the mold from the octopus. Uh -huh. um, I have a second octopus that I just got. It's much, much fancier. Um, let's see if I can at least show you what its head looks like because it doesn't really look like anything here. But nice. 
I like I, I like I like the shape of octopuses. Is it octopuses or octopi? <laughs> uh, I think it is octopuses. Okay. Right. So, so, although I think if I saw one, I was like, yeah. Uh, there, there, there's something about them that's very, very neat. Yes. Yeah. And uh, one of one of the favorite um, designs that I like to do uses uh, a skull cameo. A skull cameo. So what's a skull cameo? I mean, I know we were looking at it, but what does what does the cameo mean in the context of skull? Well, here's a classic uh, cameo. Hey, I think I'm just you know displaying my ignorance about artistic terms. That's okay. I mean, so what is cameo in the context of art? So this is um, a style of portraiture that um, that was very popular in the 19th century and actually probably 18th as well, and so um, and you would see these um, in you know that um, ladies would wear these okay. frequently, and so this is this is just sort of like the uh, the gothic version of of a cameo. Yeah. So it's like a pen on back or something. It's like a brooch or yeah. It, or... And I like to use them as sort of um, like for example, like I could have easily put that here instead of of the of the, just the, the hand, handmade skull. So that that's another way that I'm able to to create. Uh, a fairly uniform kind of of look without having to to do everything by hand. Right, right, right. Well, what I like about this too is that you you, you kind of put together whatever pieces, whatever elements that you want in order to create a, a decorative box. Mm -hmm. and, and so, a, so your palette isn't limited. And, and by that I mean like the elements of your palette aren't limited. I mean like when you're painting, it's sort of like well, I mean. You're painting, you know, it's like you're using paints, different colors, but it's all still, still paint. But here, I mean, you could use, you know, your cameos, your clay, probably beads if you wanted, huh? Do you yeah, I probably <laughs> could incorporate beads. I have, I haven't to date, but that doesn't mean that I won't. But yeah, it does allow for a more like um, three-dimensional and sculpturally aspects of of art instead of just two-dimensional. Right. So, I mean, do you have any plans to do? Anything different? And... Well, um, I don't have any major plans right now. Yeah. This uh, that uh, one of the, the one of the the things that has kept me from feeling stagnant is to incorporate different kinds of um, pop culture. So one of the most recent styles that I've done, um, actually, I am. I am demonstrating my fanishness right now with my Rise Up t-shirt, which is from Hamilton. Okay. And so I've been making Hamiltons from yeah. the mu musical Hamilton. Got it. So, so I, I basically, um, I am really sorry that I do not have one on hand because it's really cool. Uh, I take um, a tin about this size yeah. and um, I, I put the New York City skyline along the outside in black, very similar to the the um, the sky at dusk. So I use a, a yellow palette right. um, for the background and then the dark um, black for for the the buildings and then I use the the star with with the figure of Hamilton pointing up yeah. um, right, um, right, on right. the top. Right. And the, the feature particularly that I do is that I add a little bit of extra I am I am an archivist by trade, and I do a lot with historical documents, um, 17th century documents and 18th century documents are, are things that I see on a fairly regular basis. And so I, I took part of Hamilton's last letter to his wife, Eliza, and I transcribed it onto a piece of paper backwards and then applied it to to the top of the tin as part of the design it's very very subtle when it's done right so at some point i will um maybe in post doc uh post-production i can send you a photograph of one of the finished pieces well that's actually what i was going to ask you to do me yes. so do for me so, so i can do uh, that yeah I'll, I'll follow up and definitely get that cool because so. that's um but yes i i feel very very passionately about a lot of different pop culture things and so therefore i i will incorporate that into into my art yeah, and pop culture is always changing. So, so, right. so in that sense, me you, you know, can develop that way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so yeah, I, I started doing that about maybe two years ago. That I hadn't really considered that 
that particular feature. And then um, as I was um, rereading Harry Potter, I was like, oh, well, that has a really nice graphic to it. Maybe I'll just do something with that. And then so I've, I've, I've done several Harry Potter right. um, designs and using the HP that's, um, right. that's on all of the book covers. Yeah. And, uh, and from there, I started doing Wonder Woman and Superman themes. And, and I, I tend to do things that I am personally invested in because I don't want to um, start getting into a particular um, subgenre that I can't speak to. Right. So right. That's, that tends to be I got uh, my, yeah. my limiting factor because otherwise I could do all of the things. Right. Okay. So, so I'm... So do you ha do you have a favorite so far? So far, I mean, I know it's it's one of those sensitive questions that you ask artists sometimes, but it's always kind of curious as to what pops to their mind. Uh, well, my my perennial favorite is to make dragons. Okay, all right. Hey, so, so go ahead. Um, that's uh, um, actually if um, can we pause for a second? Sure. So we're back. So I wanted to get um, some of my other um, stencil templates. And this is one of the dragon designs that I use. Uh, I basically sketch it out on tracing paper. And then from there, I can actually show you that it is a very transferable medium. Like As I was mentioning with the Hamilton design, um, how easy it is to, to take um, graphite and and transfer it from from paper onto onto clay. So, a little imperfect, but so here is. Just have to figure out which. I believe that was. Nope, wrong way. Try that way. Well, I guess you'll just have to trust me that it does, in fact transfer off. I'm not, I think it's because it is old right. graphite, but, um, but I basically will take this transfer it onto the clay right. and then use that as, as, um, as my guideline. And then what I will do is I'll take different colors, run it through the garlic press. You know, it was worth it just to see this. <laughs> uh, uh. So one of the nice things about the garlic press is that you can kind of you can you can mix the colors as you go. So basically what I would do is I would simply take the clay and trace it along the edge here to create the boundary and then once it's all filled in, I'll make scales like this. Uh-huh. And so that will fill in along Like that. And so the finished piece is... So for example, I would use um, this around a circle uh -huh. or on a slightly larger um, um, tea tin. Or if I'm lucky, I will find one that's sort of a pencil case shape. I get, okay, so could you transfer that design mm -hmm. to that surface? Yeah. See, I was thinking you transfer the design to the clay and then... Yeah, so basically you would take the you you would have a sheet of plain clay. Yeah. You would use this to transfer the design you want to recreate and then use um these these thin pieces from the garlic press to to make it come alive. I got you. I got you. More like a dec more decorative. Yeah. I got you. Okay. And then you have to spend the better part of a week or so making these little tiny curly cues. For, for the design in the background. Huh. Huh. Well, that's uh, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, have you have you done any work with kids? With um, have you played? Have you done this with kids? I mean, it just seems like it'd be the thing that would be right up their alley. Uh, well, I have done a little bit of work with kids in the past, and I have a five-year-old, so um, so I tend to work with her a fair bit too yeah. on just um. You know, with uh, lower stakes clay, usually this right. is this uh, this is not the kind of clay that I want to uh, use excessively with with small people who want to use all of the clay all of the time. Actually, my my child will from time to time help me by mixing the clay with me. Yeah. So, 
so that's fun. Uh -huh. no, I was just thinking it would be a good way. And I'm not really thinking of any particular age range, maybe, yeah. maybe, but it's a nice way to kind of get the whole notion of upcycling you know, into their consciousness. All they tend to be pretty aware of those issues to start. To start and, and, and then, you know, get their artistic juices going. Exactly, yeah. 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 But, um, well, uh, well, thank you, Jess. We, you know, so, uh, it's nice to get a little demo of how an artist creates some of her art. And, and, and it's, it's very interesting work. And so I wish you continued um, success and creativity. Thank you.